Hey there, this is Fabian, and this is the online version of my uh, NFT Berlin talk, DAOs and Dragons on Lore in Web3. A surprising number of you have reached out and asked me if I can finally put this thing online, so I'll happily oblige. I'm at Fabian Stelzer on Twitter if you want to follow me. And the topic of this talk is obviously lore. Um, if you've been anywhere near Web3, NFTs, crypto, in the past 12 months, you will have encountered this concept, and you may be wondering what it is about. What is lore in this context? For one, you may have seen that many NFT projects um, and a surprising number of non-NFT crypto projects have lore channels in their Discord. So that's that's an interesting one. Um, further, we have a lot of like intellectual discussion around the concept emerging. Um, specifically, I want to point out um, two of my favorite online internet thinkers, Venkatesh Rao did a whole series on lore, which I'll link in the Twitter thread for this video. Um, Rafa, the builder, has done quite a lot of cool stuff on it. Um, and we also have this kind of like we see lore pop up in if you're doing fundraising for a crypto project. Um, it's not, it's not, or it's, pr it's, pretty, it's pretty standard to have a, a, a set on lore in your deck, which is quite interesting. So the questions that I want to dive into for this talk are, what is lore in crypto communities? What role does it play? Why did it emerge now? And how may this evolve further? And um, full disclosure, there might be more questions than answers in the end, at the end of this. So, and feel free to add your own answer onto the Twitter thread that this will appear in. So let's start with the question, what is lore? And we're gonna do the old textbook trick. Um, it's kind of lame, but sometimes a good start um, when dealing with something like this. The textbooks will tell us that lore is a body of traditions and knowledge on a subject held by a particular group of people typically passed from person to person by word of mouth. Um, okay, so that's the historical perspective on it. If we think about the ways in which we, if we do a breadth first search in looking at the way in which lore has popped up on Web3, I think the first thing that we will uh, probably look at is something that I would classify as creator lore. It's top down. Creator lore is basically if you have, you know, like if you have an NFT project such as the Forgotten Runes, um, uh, Wizards and Warriors, or even um, the sort of by market cap most significant NFT project uh, right now, um, you know, Board Ape Yacht Club, they have like a whole range of ideas about the world and the history and the narrative in which their NFT collection is placed. Um, in Forgotten Runes, they call this their meta narrative. Uh, Yuga Labs um, with Board Ape Yacht Club has uh, sort of put a lot about their lore into the leaked pitch deck they've uh, used for their recent fundraise. Um, and that's kind of like, you know, the classical style of lore as you may have also encountered it in the 90s. Um, if we think about early computer games, um, this is one of my favorite computer games of all time, System Shock from 1994 where they're doing a sort of like what the lore in that game world is basically you wake up on a spaceship and you have no memory whatsoever of what happened. You don't know where you are, who you are, and you slowly have to put together the story and the narrative and the world you're in by reading bits and pieces of audio logs and emails that you encounter on the ship. And that's the lore. That's the lore of um, System Shock's world. And you slowly uncover it. Um, and that's all creator lore. That's all done by the team that created the fantastic game. And they've done a fantastic job on the, on the lore as well. Um, a slightly more interesting sort of creator lore that we've seen on Web3 is something that Dom Hoffman, the inventor of Loot, um, called Minimum Viable Fidelity. And that's an interesting form of lore where uh, you don't get the full story, right? Um, you don't get the full world, you just get bits and pieces. But um, the only way to discover the rest of the lore is by coming up with it yourself. So that's still kind of like Minimum Viable Fidelity is still creator lore top down, but it requires a counterpart of bottom-up lore uh, to emerge. And that's you know where it gets more decentralized and more interesting and more um, fun in the context of Web3. And this is where, what I would call lore as owner fiction, which is kind of like derived from the idea of fan fiction. Um, it's a form of bottom-up self-expression, right? So um, again, if we look at Forgotten Runes Wizards, uh, many of the folks in that community will come up with very rich stories about their wizards, like how are they kind of um, uh, embedded into the Forgotten Runes Wizards world, what, what they're all about, what their traits are, what the history is. 
Uh, and that's all written by the owners usually. And this is why I call it owner fiction and not fan fiction. Because there's obviously an interesting economical element. You're not writing um, you know, fan fiction for Harry Potter, but instead you are writing lore, owner fiction for a character that you actually own, um, or that you could actually also sell. And um, uh, that gives the whole thing the sort of typical interesting economical uh, uh, twist that we see so much on Web3. Um, the way to think about the sort of owner fiction stuff, I guess, is very similar to uh, the way you would come up with a character in a pen and paper or tabletop ro role-playing game, right? One of the first steps in those games is for you to sit down with a piece of paper and really think about the character that you're going to play and that, that you're going to enact in uh, the story that the game master, the sort of top-down lore master, is laying out for you with you contributing the individual parts of the narrative through your own character. Um, and there's lore as community fiction, where um, it still is kind of bottom-up, um, because there's not a creator that comes up with the lore, but rather the entire community comes together. Um, a great example of that is Tim Shell's uh, Open Quill program. Uh, Tim Shell and a bunch of other folks from the Lootverse came together and said, we want to bring the Lootverse to life with uh, community fiction, and what we're going to do is we're going to write a book about loot and um, a book of short stories uh, one of which I contributed to, it was great fun, and it's a great, great example of um, lore as community fiction, which adds to the, you have the minimum viable loot collection, that just like triggers some fantasies and ideas about this world, and then you have the community come together, bringing it to life through the invention of stories, narrative, richness, um, sort of narrative tapestry in which these bags exist. Again, that's a bit like pen and paper role-playing games, tabletop role-playing games, but um, it's a bit like if you had a sort of fantastic group of players that uh, then actually comes up with a media product around their uh, role playing. So that's fun. We've got lore as community rituals, which is kind of like a sub point to lore as community fiction. Um, like you'll find many communities have these very idiosyncratic ways of communicating. Um, like in another Dom Hoffman project, um, Corruptions, we've got this thing where we say, okay instead of good morning or GM. And um, that kind of stuck. And it's a sort of interesting meme that uh, we use outside of uh, the Discord as well to recognize each other. Uh, so that's, that's part of lore, I would say. Um, uh, community rituals are part of the sort of broader context of bottom-up um, community lore. And then finally, we've got a lore as, you know, um, fluid community world building, right? This is if we put all the sort of um, bottom-up lore building bottom-up law writing together, um, we end up with very rich, decentralized world building and stories and narrative um, that uh, emerges as a function of a community coming together. Um, yeah. Then we have like something that is less weird and um, maybe also less interesting, in my opinion, but nevertheless probably going to be extremely relevant um, moving forward um, with respect to onboarding new folks and uh, turning these projects into like, you know, proper media empires. And that's what we would call professional lore, right? Um, again, I'm using Forgotten Runes as an example here. They've actually partnered with a um, uh, kind of like very successful film studio um, that is going to produce a sort of like cartoon uh, movie for Forgotten Runes. The trailer is extremely promising. So this is a top-notch production by, um, you know, it's not owner fiction. This is, these are pros that come in and um, take some of that treasury and turn it into uh, you know, a media product that then will hopefully help grow the brand of Forgotten Runes as a narrative brand in general. Um, we've got lore as meta lore. So this is if we take the entirety of the crypto space, the stories that we've experienced together over the cycles, they're all part of the meta lore of crypto. You know, it's like Novogratz getting a Luna tattoo, instant lore. Multicoin buying eight figures of loot um, when it was at all-time high, that's lore. <laughs> and we have like, you know, NFT collections, like as we go into a bear market, we've seen NFT collections pop up that deal with bears. And I would argue, yes, that is also part of the crypto meta lore, and it's kind of like riding these waves, uh, these mimetical waves that uh, help propel it forward. And then it gets really interesting as we look into the recent intellectual debates and contributions to the question of what lore is. Um, I'm going to start with Venkatesh Rao here. Again, one of my favorite thinkers on, on uh, all things internet. 
He's uh, at VGR on Twitter. Give him a follow. Venkatesh writes that, I mean, basically he's kind of conceptualizing lore as something he calls a millennial management science. And he writes, lore can be understood as a response to LinkedIn-style motivational content that insults your intelligence. So that's fun. And uh, he goes on, marketing is the story. Insiders tell outsiders to influence them in some way. Lore is the story insiders tell themselves to manage their own psyches. And further, lore is something you witness and attempt to shape as it emerges, if it emerges, not something you design and execute. You cannot, for instance, set out to write an origin myth, at least not one that will work as lore, though it may work as part of a grift. You can only recognize and institutionalize one. So that's really interesting if we unpack this. Um, I'm not 100% convinced um, that this isn't just like a specific definition of the most interesting subset of lore. He obviously discards any type of lore as being relevant when it comes from the sort of like top down, like the stuff that we've seen as creator lore, professional lore. He would probably not categorize that as lore, um, but rather say, no, lore is only interesting as a sort of emergent property of bottom up community stuff. And it's also not interesting as something that is turned to the outside, but much rather it's a, it's a thing that a community uses to manage its sort of like mental states and um, uh, its psyche. Super interesting stuff. Uh, Raf the Builder is going in a similar direction. Again, um, really, really great person. You should follow him on Twitter. He came up with this framework that places lore almost as a primitive within a human resources context around community management, right? Where we used to have these things in startups. Um, we still have them. Like we've got mission statement, ethics, um, like what are what what are our values, etc. And he adds like lexicon and lore as, and in some sense even like rhythm as like additional primitives here, which make um, sense in the context of Web3 communities vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, your old Web2 startup, um, where lore is basically dealing with the question of why are we going there? Like, what is it that we're doing? Why are we going there? What's our origin story? What are the saints and demons that we're dealing with? Well, the relics, the totems, the stories, what's the narrative content of our group? Really quite interesting, again, uh, I think probably not as purely insight-focused as Venkatesh Rao's take, but nevertheless, I would like categorize this as part of like a sort of lore as an HR function, almost. And if we place this stuff that we've seen now on a sort of like coordinate system where one axis uh, is centralized versus decentralized and the other is internal versus external, which is just one way of mapping it out, and it's the first that I came up here with for this talk, I might come up with more, uh, then we have like on the on the centralized externally focused side we've got professional law right you do this from a very centralized creator standpoint and you do this mostly um to sort of like attract an external audience right if forgotten runes is successful with their titmouse uh comic that cartoon that they're doing that's going to attract new people into the ecosystem and that's probably also kind of like one of the main reasons why they're doing it on um the other end of the spectrum, we've got, you know, owner fiction, which is extremely decentralized. And um, it's kind of like sitting between, like, if you're writing owner fiction, you're doing this partly for the community, for yourself, but also for others, right? You want to, uh, you want others to sort of like maybe stumble upon your work, stumble upon your, uh, your contribution to the world building, and hopefully they will get into the, um, into the community as well. So an example here is I did like a documentary project for Dom Hoffman's amazing Corruptions uh, collection. And I've been like for a while getting like weekly messages from people saying, hey, I actually got a corruption or two because of your documentary. And that's great, right? So there's a sort of, again, there's an interesting economical uh, angle here um, that's pretty curious. Um, and then on the lower end, if we look at the, the internal side of things down south on this map, we've got, you know, organization lore, management science lore, even meta lore, which is like just really mostly dealing with um, the stuff that Venkatesh describes as ways of managing your own psyche, managing your internal sort of community, mental states, and so on. So it's a, I would say there's, there's a, quite a spectrum of what lore is and can be. And um, I would probably argue that it makes sense to look at it from this broader perspective instead of just saying, okay, um, we have to cut this off at uh, at a certain um, Y value and say anything else is just not lore and we're only dealing with the internal stuff. No, I think it makes sense to look at this from this sort of broader perspective. If we do this, we end up with two functions for lore. One is internal, 
It's about managing your own psyche. And I would argue building your home world is what it's all about. And second is the external function of lore, which is we want to signal cohesion and attract new members. Um, because and when it comes to the sort of like external function of lore, it is a fact that lore is leaking towards the outside. Like any cool lore that you come up with will be leaking outside. And um, the metaphor that I'm using here on this rather messy slide is one of a group that is playing a sort of tabletop role-playing game. And um, there's like three layers to it, right? There's the sort of LARPing that you do for yourself when you enact your character. This is something that I would call squatting, which is like inside of the group, you're LARPing together and you're having a lot of fun doing it. And then, like, if you think about this from a Let's Play context, and interestingly, there are, like, now super successful tabletop role-playing game groups with millions of viewers, um, uh, where you have viewers watching these people play um, RPG games together. Um, so that's quite interesting. And that's the sort of outside audience uh, perspective, where you have an audience that is being entertained by um, that world-building that you're doing. Um, and I think it's quite similar with NFT projects, actually. So... If I had to come up with a sort of like intermediate definition of what I view as true lore, it would probably be true lore is an ephemeral body of authentic fantasy self-expression, both on individual and community levels. True lore is bottom up, but can also be seeded top down. That's like what Venkatesh Ra calls lore crafting. Its main function is to build a home world internally and to signal cohesion externally. Another question that popped up for me in this context was um, the following. Is lore a renaissance of oral culture? It's obviously kind of like dealing with the question of where is this all coming from and um, what does it mean? And uh, obviously oral culture is to be understood as opposed to literary culture, right? And the idea is um, cultures and the way they function before the invention of writing. Quite obviously, it's almost impossible to imagine how different these cultures used to be um, because we have to sort of reimagine everything that we know about, you know, like learning and understanding and um, sort of like getting an understanding of history and where we're coming from without any text, like without any um, uh, literary technology. Um, and the, uh, the reason why I had this hunch that there is like some sort of connection between oral culture and lore is um, that there are some features that I think kind of like fitted quite neatly. I don't have like a great answer as to um, uh, where this is going and um, what this could actually mean, but I wanted to put this idea out there. Or if you compare like oral versus literary culture, we'll find that oral culture is much more like many-to-many -many focused in terms of communication, whereas literary culture quite literally means if I write a book, I can beam my thoughts into millions of minds simultaneously. I, it's like a very powerful telepathic technology that we have with writing, right? Um, and uh, that doesn't exist in, in, in oral cultures. Um, to some extent it does, if you have a sort of great orator or speaker, but uh, nevertheless, it's much more many-to-many -many and much more decentralized in that context. Um, at the same time, uh, further, uh, literary culture is quite literal, <laughs> literally literal, whereas oral culture, when you describe something, has, to, it has traditionally been much more um, memetic-focused or monomic-focused because um, the way the human brain remembers things best is when they're narrated in a very rich way. So instead of just like writing down the sort of step-by-step uh, uh, -step instruction that's extremely boring and literal that you need to follow to get some, some place, um, in, uh, if I want you to remember something that I can only tell you and that you need to memorize, um, it's much, much more, more effective to be incredibly rich in fantasy uh, incredibly rich in how it's described, sometimes exaggeratedly so. Um, and I guess, like, partially that is what we're seeing with, like, meme culture and crypto as well, right? Um, so there are, like, layers of exaggeration and mimetic richness that we usually don't necessarily find in sort of uh, written language. Um, and, of course, oral cultures are, like, fluid and playful, whereas literary cultures are much more fixed and hierarchical. This is a sort of half-baked... <laughs> idea. Uh, it's a thought I wanted to put out. Um, I think there's something there, but I, I have to do a whole bunch of uh, uh, like thinking further on this um, in order to flash it out. If you have ideas, uh, if you have comments, drop them in the thread. Finally, um, as to the question, why, why now? Um, I have a few, like, wh why, why are we seeing this concept emerge now? Um, I have a few hypotheses. Um, one is actually due to the sort of primary mode of communication that we're using, which is obviously Discord. 
Um, and uh, the question, or the hypothesis here is that the, the emergence of lore is due to the ephemerality of Discord. Um, and by that I mean that Discord is a, even though it's written technology, right, um, it's not really used like that. It's um, used in a much more sort of oral life experience type of way. So you can obviously scroll back in Discord and see what everyone talked about um, while you were sort of uh, busy with IRL constraints. Um, but that's not really what most people are doing, right? Instead, of, instead Discord is best experienced live. And if you weren't there in the moment, you kind of miss that moment. And that's just like um, the way it is. And maybe that ephemerality, that sort of um, oralness of it contributes a bit to the importance and the emergence of lore as we see it today. Um, that ties in with the general sort of fluidity of Tao life, which is obviously much more, much less centralized and hierarchical than like a traditional company setting. And um, lastly, again, these are just like bits and uh, uh, pieces of a theory here, nothing final. Uh, we obviously have like, Web3 has put memes on economical steroids. And um, maybe the thing that we're seeing emerge with lore is just what you get when you pair memes with this economical power that is conveyed to us through tokens and um, the ownership economy that uh, Web3 enables. So yeah. These are the thoughts that I'm going to uh, leave you with. As you can see, I have not updated um, these slides. They're pretty much the same as they were when I gave this talk at NFT Berlin. Uh, I am continuing to uh, think about um, these matters and will eventually do an updated version. In the meantime, um, yeah, feel free to drop your comments, thoughts, ideas uh, onto the Twitter thread, and uh, we can continue our fun discussion here. Thank you.